I want you to open your Bible with me, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, there's a reason we're going to Deuteronomy, and I think you'll, you'll understand it in just a moment. I'm taking to some scriptures that are not as well known. Now, arguably, we're talking in this session about studying the Bible, and arguably the most famous verse on Bible study uh, that is frequently used is 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's a lot of truth in that one verse. So we, we know we're commanded to study the word of truth. It is not enough that you wave a Bible, carry a Bible, and profess to believe the Bible. You must study the word of truth. Now, Jesus answered the why to that in the Gospel according to John. He said to a group of very religious people, are there any religious people here right now, any religious people? You may say, well, that's not the way I think of myself. That's what the world would think of you. But sometimes religious people miss it. Did you know that? Sometimes religious people get into all the motions and mechanics, the, the ritual and routine, and they miss the, the sum and substance of the whole thing. Jesus looked at the most religious people of his day, and he said to them, search the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. That's more than a casual reading. That's more than just a common cursory view of the Bible. Search it. Dig it out. Be diligent about it. It's another word for studying the Bible. Search the Scriptures. Then he said this, For these are they which testify of me. You say you want to know God better? It comes through Bible study. And so, if we're going to go deeper with the Lord, we must go deeper into the Word of God. And before I show you this, let me just tell you, you're never going to get to the bottom. Never. You're never going to plumb the depths because God is infinite. His Word is exhaustive. Have you ever noticed sometimes you go back to a passage you've read a hundred times and see something for the first time? Let me tell you why that is. There's nothing new in the Bible. It's the eternal, forever settled Word of God. But it is because at different times in your life, God will connect different Scriptures to right where you are. And the Holy Spirit will turn the light bulb on and make something really plain to you. That's why we go back through it again and again and again. And every time we study it, we go a little deeper. Now, Deuteronomy, the last of the five books of Moses, is a book about Bible study. In fact, at the beginning of it, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he, he commissions parents to study the Word with their children and to talk about it in their homes, in their heart and in their homes. Uh, the word Deuteronomy, you might write this down, means second law. And if you take Deuteronomy and put it parallel to the book of Exodus, you're going to find there's a whole lot of repetition here. It is literally a repetition of what God had already said. Remember I said to you that we are forgetful people? Well, God is not afraid to repeat Himself. And when God repeats Himself, it's never because He forgot He said it. When God repeats Himself, it's because there's something there He doesn't want us to forget that He said. And one of the great laws of Bible study is you go over it again and again and again and again. Paul said to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So we come to the book of repetition. We come to the book of the second law to learn something about how to study the Bible more effectively. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 17. And let me draw your attention to a passage that I think is very much neglected. And we need to give some serious attention to it. Uh, if you're going to get beneath the surface of Scripture, into the heart of God, here's how you do it. Look at Deuteronomy 17, verse number 18. We're jumping right in the middle of a passage where God is giving direction to His king. And we understand we're, we're not kings of nations. He's made us kings and priests with Him. Uh, that's the context of the text. But look what He says for the king to do. And it shall be, verse 18, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Everybody take your pen and circle the word write. Did you ever notice that the king of Israel had to write out his own copy of the Scriptures? Let me ask you something. Was the king a prophet? No. Was the king a priest? No. He was a king. He was the political leader, the governmental leader of the land, and God said one of the requirements was you have to write out your own copy of the Bible. Oh, hold on just a minute. Didn't he have scribes? A whole plethora of them. He had servants everywhere and religious teachers. He could have certainly leaned on those people. God said that's not good enough. Would you like to know why that is? 
Because God said, if you're going to be what you ought to be, you need to know everything I have written and have a personal understanding of it. Our American Christianity, which frankly is a long ways from Acts Christianity, has become so professional that we expect the pastor, the Bible teacher, to know the Word, and then he's going to tell us what God has said. Friend, I just want to remind you that that man is not your priest. We have a great high priest, that's Jesus Christ, and we believe in the priesthood of every believer, which means you have access to God. If you don't know God and you don't know the Bible, it's your fault. Because God opened the door wide. Jesus went through the gate into heaven and left the door open behind him. He gave access. He gave you the opportunity. And we neglect it. Now, there's a little practical nugget here before we read on. Could I recommend to you that one of the great ways to study Scripture is to write Scripture? I didn't do much of this until the last two or three years, frankly. I never even thought much about it. We, we talk about reading the Bible. Everybody gets that. But may I just ask, how many of you in this room ever personally write out portions of Scripture? Would you raise your hand, please? That's fantastic. That's maybe a third of the people in the room. But may I say to everybody else, there's a tremendous benefit in it. Your mind works while your pencil moves. So while you're writing out the Word of God, you're not changing any, you're just word for word writing out the Scripture. It makes you think about the individual words. It slows you down, and I, I would recommend that to you. Uh, I, I was talking to a young man the other day who every day writes out a portion of Scripture in text form and sends it out. He's doing it as much for him as he is for other people. I was preaching in Portland, Oregon a few weeks ago, and the man who was taking me back to the, to the uh, airport, we just got talking about the Word of God and how wonderful it is. He said, can I tell you something I did? I said, sure. He said, I've never done this before. He said, it's one of the most exciting things I ever did. He said, I wrote the whole Bible out. I said, come again? He said, I got to thinking, if I'm really going to know the Scripture, it would be good for me to write every word. He said, so I just did it a book at a time and made myself some goals. And he said, I wrote every word from Genesis to Revelation. He said, I can't tell you what it did for me in my understanding of Scripture. Isn't that interesting? Write it. Now keep reading. Look at verse number 19. And it shall be with him. By the way, I think the Word of God ought to be with you. It certainly ought to be in your heart. We hide God's Word in our heart that we will not sin against him, but carry the Bible with you. And frankly, with technology now, that's getting easier, isn't it? To have a copy of Scripture with you. But let it be with you, and he shall. What's the next word, class? I didn't hear you. He shall what? One more time. He shall what? Everybody remember what we said? We start with what? And we read the Bible. He shall read therein all the days of his life that. See, the reading's not the goal, it's the means, it's the vehicle. That he may learn. Everybody circle the word learn. Learn to fear the Lord as God. To keep all the words of this law and these statutes and to what? Do them. Not just hearers of the word. You see all the action verbs here? Write, read, learn, fear, keep, do. I mean, you almost get the idea the Lord wants us to really know his word. And let it affect the way we live every day. And one little interesting side note, this is Moses. In Deuteronomy, we're, we're with Moses. Did you know when you come to the book of Joshua, uh, that Joshua himself would write out his own copy of the, the law of the Scriptures? So there's a principle here where people are themselves individually engaging with Scripture. That's what Bible study does. That's what makes the Bible come alive. People who say, well, I just don't understand the Bible. It is because we just think we're going to skim the pages and something's going to jump off the page at you. Occasionally, that may happen. But if you're really going to know what God says, you're going to have to be willing to study the Bible. You're still in Deuteronomy, right? Turn over a few pages to Deuteronomy 31. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number 9. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi. Now, you're not going to write any more Scripture. <laughs> No more scripture being given. We have all the word of God. Revelation says you don't add to, you don't take away from. But we can write out portions of scripture. Come down, would you please, to verse number 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children. Remember what I said to you earlier? Everybody that can understand needs the word. And thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may, mark these words here, that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and Observed to do all the words of this law. Do you see it's the exact same progression that we saw first in Deuteronomy chapter number 17? By the way, it's significant to know when these words were spoken. They're on the precipice of going into the promised land. 
At every new beginning or transition in life, you need to give extra attention to the Bible. Write that down, would you please? At every transition in life, some of you right now are sitting at a crossroads. New beginnings, endings of some things, next stage, next season, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to get in the Word, and the Word is going to show you the way. Several years ago, when God led us into full-time evangelism, I had taught the Bible for almost 20 years in a, in a church and Bible college, and I, I would have told you then, I thought I knew Scripture, at least had some understanding of Scripture. I'm just going to tell you, that six to nine months of my life, God transformed me in His Word. The Bible came alive. Like, there are things in Scripture I never got, and it was like suddenly they connected. Do you know why that is? Because the Word is, is practical. It's always something that relates and connects. You don't have to make it that. It connects to wherever you're living. And there are junctures in life, and a new beginning season is one of those where the Word of God will take on a whole new meaning to you because God will help bring it into connection with your life. One more scripture in Deuteronomy. Turn over a few more pages, would you please, to Deuteronomy 32. This is near, near the end now. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 45. Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And I love Deuteronomy 32, 46. Look at verse number 46. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do. All the words of this law. Look at the all, all, all. You need all of it. But notice this. Mark this phrase. You've got to set your heart to it. That's what Bible study is. It's putting your heart in it. And look at verse number 47. Here's why it's important. For it is not a vain thing for you. This is not some empty ritual. Because. Would you read the next four words out loud with me, class? Ready? Because what? It is your life. And through this thing you shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. You want to go in? And conquer, you want to live in victory, you want to have all God has for you, you need the Word of God. This is not just, oh, that's a part of my life. No, 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 no. This is your life. See, one of the dangers, we talked about Bible reading, that's the starting place, but it's not the stopping place. One of the dangers is people get this idea that they're going to read their chapters in the morning, check a box, pat themselves on the back and say, okay, I got that out of the way for the day. No. The Word of God is to be woven into the whole of your life. That's why it's not just devotions. By the way, interesting tidbit. Did you know the only time the word devotions is used in the Bible, it's used in the negative? It's in the book of Acts, and it's for idolatry. Remember the people in Mars Hill, Athens? He beheld their devotions to the unknown God. Uh, I would argue, if you're not careful, even devotions becomes a goal, and even some system becomes an idol and takes the place of the real aim. No, no, we're not, we're not after just having devotions. We want a devotional walk with Jesus all through our life. Say, so what's the difference, preacher? It's the difference between giving God 10 minutes in the morning and your whole life. And I'm telling you, the thing that will help connect the Word to your whole life is learning to truly and rightly study the Bible. With that in mind, let's walk through how to do that, all right? And we can't be exhaustive even about this, but let me give you some foundational principles I think will help you. Number one, write this down. Let's start with preparation. You've got to be prepared. Now, God has already prepared His Word, but you have to be prepared. What does that look like? Well, we've touched on this some already, but for Bible study, it is the same but even more intense. First of all, I would say you need to be alone. You can study in public places, but as much as possible, you need to be you and God. How many of you know in our busy world, and some of you are thinking right now about your busy life, you say, that's impossible. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Because this is more about concentration than it is about isolation. So maybe you're not the only person in the house, but you can get in a place where you can really concentrate on studying God's Word. Do you know the name Susanna Wesley? Uh, mother of the famous John and Charles Wesley. She had 10 children. May I ask you mothers, do you think it was noisy at their house? 10 children. She walked with God. Did you know every day at a certain time of the day, she pulled her apron over her head? It's true. 
You read about it. She had a certain place in the house. She'd go and sit, and she'd just take her apron and pull it up over her head. And the children had been taught when mother's apron is over her head, she's meeting with God, and we don't interrupt her. And as lively as it was, she found a way, she made a way to get alone and to concentrate on what God had for her. So part of the preparation is you need to be alone. Not only that, you need to be attentive. Remove distractions. Uh, leave your mobile device in the other room. You say, well, I'm using it. All right, put it on Do Not Disturb. I like to read and use Bible reading plans even on my phone. I do it frequently. But one detriment to that, and could I just recommend, you still need a copy of the Word of God. One detriment, even when you come to church, I see people now, just, they only use their phone. I'm not on a crusade against it. There's no sin about it. But I, I think it is very often a means of distraction. Do you know how quickly it, it is easy for us to flip off the Bible app and go to social media? I mean, recently I was reading my Bible reading on, on my Bible app, and a text came through. And the minute I saw that text, my mind took a detour. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And immediately, I had to care for that. i got to fix that. i gotta, I got to answer that question. i got to do that. No, no. The text you need to worry about right now is the Word of God. So whatever, whatever tools you're going to use, fine. You work that out. Everybody's mind works differently. But you need to try to remove distraction. Turn the television off. Um, try to remove anything that would vie for your attention. We battle enough of that on the inside. We don't need to have a great amount of that on the outside. I would say get all your tools together. What's your number one tool for Bible study? Man, that's a smart class. Have your Bible. Have one you can see. When I was young, I didn't even think about that, but I'm starting to understand that now. Be in a place that's well lit. Get your, get your journal ready and get your pen ready. And if you're going to use another resource that might help you a little bit uh, to shed light on something in Scripture, get all that ready so you don't have to go hunting for it and, and interrupt. There's no intermission. Prepare yourself. Number two, after preparation, by the way, let me give you a verse. Can I just give you a verse? It only takes 60 seconds. Turn over a few pages to 1 Samuel 9. I came across this verse the other day, and I just thought it was really interesting. God had something he wanted to say to his king, to Saul. He's speaking through Samuel the prophet, but look at 1 Samuel 9, 27. You ever notice this verse? I love the word of God. Don't you love the word of God? I'm telling you, you never exhaust this thing. Look at 1 Samuel 9, verse 27. As they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. In other words, get by yourself for a minute. I love the end of verse 27. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Hey, let me ask you. How many of you would like to live in the last phrase of that verse? Like God to show you something from his word? Let me recommend this. Let everybody pass on. And you stand still a while. Be still and know that I am God. That's not just about externals. That's internal. That's, that's pausing things. You know the hardest thing to do in prayer? Jesus said, shut the door. Prayer's not hard. If you know how to talk, you know how to pray. Prayer's not hard. Shutting the door is hard. Same thing is true with Bible study because there's all these voices vying for attention. Try to be still and prepare yourself to hear from God. Second step, would you write this down? And there's, there's no equation here, no formula, but they're, they're ingredients. That's what I would call these, ingredients and elements of good Bible study. First is preparation. Second is examination. You want to make a thorough examination of the passage. You've got to get acquainted with it. Uh, one of my favorite Bible students who became a great Bible teacher and author was a man by the name of G. Campbell Morgan. Anybody ever heard of G. Campbell Morgan? I love Campbell Morgan's things because he always brings things out of Scripture that I never saw. You ever, you ever be around somebody like that and you think, where did that come from? Like, that's it there. I, how did I miss that? Campbell Morgan's one of those people that helps me think. So I love to read him because he primes my pump a little bit. You know, he brings things out of a text. Well, I think I found out why. I read this past week that G. Campbell Morgan would not teach through a book of the Bible until he had read through it 50 times. <laughs> 50 times. Let me ask you a question. If a man's read through a book of the Bible 50 times, you think he's made a pretty good examination of it? Yeah. He's given attention to it. There's a great little book I want to recommend to you called How to Master the English Bible by James M. Gray. James M. Gray was a great Bible teacher. And can I boil the whole book down to the thesis? 
James M. Gray said this, if you want to, to really master a book of the Bible, and I'd recommend you pick a book. Every year I try to take a book of the Bible. I have a life book. It's the book of Philippians, my favorite book. Just like I have a life verse, I have a life book. You may take a book of the Bible uh, for a season. But he said the way to master a book of the Bible is you need to sit down as much as possible and read through the whole book at one sitting. Now, that may take a little time. It certainly would take more time with the Psalms than it would with Philippians. Isn't that right? And you may not do that necessarily with the Psalms. But the idea here is you're making a thorough examination. Well, when you're examining it, what are you looking for? Write down a couple thoughts here. Number one, you're getting familiar with the text and the context. Both are very important. Sometimes I'll hear even Bible teachers and Bible preachers preach from a text and they take a phrase and they preach some huge sermon that they've concocted, and I'm using my words purposely, that they've concocted that God never intended from that text. Would you like to know what was missing? Context. Every scripture has a setting. Every text has a context, and you've got to find the context. Let me tell you what it means. It means if you're going to study chapter 8, you better know what happened in chapter 7. And then I'd recommend you go ahead and look at what's going to happen in chapter 9 because you need to understand the general flow. Every chapter connects to all the other chapters. Now let me really blow your mind. Every book connects to all the other books. You need to actually know how the book you're studying connects to the whole of Scripture, to the Testament that it's in, to the other books of the Bible. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But you need, look, before you get into the weeds studying every little thing, you better do a 30,000-foot flyover and get you a bird's eye view and get a, a general feel for the context of that book. That's one of the things you're examining. Another thing I'd recommend in your examination is you identify the paragraph. What is a paragraph? It's a unit of thought. It has a starting point and a stopping point. Uh, it goes together. Chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. You can study the history of them. They only came about in the last few hundred years. Now, for the record, I'm glad we have them, or we would all still be looking for the passage in Deuteronomy. So they're a great aid to Bible study, but they can also be a hindrance because many times you've got to read through the verse, through to the next chapter, to get the whole of what is being said. One of the things you pay attention to is the grammar. Forgive me, you young people that are listening. The grammar of the passage. Is there a period there? No. Then the thought's not done. Look at your transition words. Therefore. Oh, he's getting ready to say something that connects to what he just said. What are you doing? You're identifying the unit of thought. See, some people think in a session like this, I'm going to try to teach how to, how to study a verse or how to study a chapter. I don't, I'm not going to talk to you about how to study a verse, how to study a chapter. I'm going to say to you, find a unit of thought in the passage and study that. Where does the story begin? Where does it end? Where does the emphasis Paul is making begin? Where does that end? Where is there a shift? You will only know that through examination. And then, write down another word. You've got preparation, examination, here we go, observation. Once you've made a general examination of the passage, you need to get down into some specific observations. And I'm going to tell you some things I look for. Can I just give you, throw out a handful of things I look for when I'm studying a passage of Scripture? I look for the characters in the passage. Are there any characters here? I need to get acquainted with them. Is there a king here, a priest here, a prophet here, a New Testament preacher here? Who is the person? I'm looking for characters. I'm looking for places. Now, this week, I'm speaking in a meeting, and I'm going to preach God helping me from a place the whole, the whole week. I'm going to take the church that I'm going to be in to Bethel, and we're going to just pitch our tent and drive our stakes down, and we're going to live in Bethel. Because that place has so much significance. Now, you don't want to read into Scripture and spiritualize things that God doesn't make the message and get, get caught up with peripheral things. But I'm saying to you, places and people recorded in Scripture are there for a reason. Why are they there? That's something I'm looking for. Something else I'm looking for are key words. Remember I said to you, keys open? Keys unlock. All right, does that portion of Scripture have a key word? The key word of Philippians is rejoice or joy, some form of it. If you don't get that, you don't get the book. 
you miss the whole thing. So you're looking for key words. Something else, you're looking for repetitions. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but when God repeats himself, that's very important. Look at the repetitions in a passage. It could be a repetition of word. It could be a repetition of thought. It could be a repetition of emphasis. Well, you find the same word five times in ten verses, you might get the idea the Lord's trying to tell you something. I mean, you know, if the passage just keeps talking about the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, then probably if you're going to understand the redemptive passage, you need to give a little concentration to the blood of Jesus. You're looking for the repetitions. And then I alluded to this a moment ago. Pay attention to the grammar of the passage because that will help you to see shifts and transitions. I wish I had time to read it to you, but when I was a Bible, uh, a Bible college student years ago, one of my Bible teachers was with Jesus now, uh, made us read a story one day. It was called The Professor, the Professor, the Fish, and Agassiz. I still remember it. You can find it online, I think. The Professor, the Fish, and Agassiz. It was not a Christian story, but it changed the way I studied the Bible. The whole story was that a, a certain student wanted to learn to study in a particular field, but he got assigned under a professor who made him look at a dead fish for hours on end and chart the fish and, and uh, count the rows of scales and, and draw the fish. and I mean, this went on for days and days and days and days. And the whole article, the whole story was the student's testimony that that professor did him more good in that season, not just with his field of study, but with learning to make general observations about anything that he was studying because here was the number one lesson he took away. Here was his takeaway. He said, I learned when I thought I had it all, when I thought I understood to look again. You know what most of us need to do? Look again. Like when you think you know what that passage says, you might want to look again. What is this? It's preparation, it's examination, it's observation. Number four, interrogation. Now we're getting down... Somebody said to the basic nitty and the fundamental gritty, all right? Now we're getting down to how you're going to get out of the passage what all is there. You've got to ask questions of the passage. Be inquisitive. How many of you would say you're a curious person by nature? That will serve you well in Bible study. It can be a distraction sometimes. You can get off, you know, the, the track. But if you're not a curious person, you need to learn to be curious when you come to Scripture. You come with questions. Hey, it's okay to have questions as long as you come to the Word for the answers. Bring your questions to the passage. I wrote this down years ago. A famous poet said this, and I, I like it. He said, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. I send them over land and sea. I send them east and west, but after they have worked for me, I give them all the rest. Listen to the questions. You might even want to write them down. What, why, when, how, where, who. When you come to a passage, you should come with questions. Who's writing? Who are they writing to? Where are they? Geographically, where are they? When did these people live? What period of time were they living and serving Jesus in? Why was this passage given to us? What is God trying to say to me? How can I take this eternal truth and apply it where I live right now? What are you doing? You're just asking and answering questions. And so, if you're really going to be the Bible student God wants you to be, you've got to come with some interrogation. Let me give you a footnote to that. Would you write this down? Interrogation leads to the right interpretation. Someone said that every scripture has one primary interpretation. It may have many applications, but one primary interpretation. That's what God says, that's what God meant, and that's what God wants to emphasize. I want to say to you, it is impossible to get the right interpretation without good interrogation. It's impossible. Let me just ask, I'm curious, I'm curious now. How many of you have a commentary, a commentator that you enjoy? Would you raise your hand? That's good. Uh, probably my go-to old commentator, uh, the first one I ever was given was Through the Bible by J. Vernon McGee. It's very simple, very basic, very devotional, and very good. Uh, J. Vernon McGee was quite a Bible teacher. 
and he went literally through the Bible. I'd recommend the through the Bible commentaries. If you want something very basic, good starting point, that's a good one. Probably my personal favorite of the old commentators would be Matthew Henry. Uh, Matthew, and by the way, you're not going to agree with everybody all the time, but Matthew Henry knew God. Did you know Matthew Henry's daddy made all the children in their house memorize and quote a different verse of Psalm 119 every day of their life? You know what Psalm 119 is? The Psalm of the Scriptures. 176 verses long, too, by the way. They had to memorize the whole thing, quote a different one every day. He fell in love with the Bible. And he made so many great observations, and that's what's in his commentary, and he makes me think. Uh, there's a, there's a, a current commentary you can find online by a man named David Guzik. I wouldn't line up with him exactly where he is, but it's good. It's helpful. It's well outlined. It's uh, interpretationally and applicationally, I think, very good. Part of the reason I like uh, his commentary is called Enduring Word. Part of the reason I like it is that he reads all the great commentators. So great writers usually are great readers. He's culling from many different places. It's not just his thought. And so when I read Guzik, I, I hear G. Campbell Morgan and F.B. Meyer and Andrew Murray and Charles Spurgeon and Alexander McLaren and on and on. So I like that. He kind of pulled it all together in one place. But I'm not telling you all of this. And by the way, Matthew Henry, uh, George Whitfield, the great revivalist, carried it in his saddlebags and read it on his knees. That's what he thought of it. Charles Spurgeon said every minister should read through Matthew Henry at least once in his lifetime. That's pretty interesting. If you ever look at it, it's a big set. It's not light reading, okay? But I'm telling you all this not to recommend commentaries. I'm telling you all this to tell you, do you know what a commentary is? It's another man's observations. It's another man's meditations. It's okay, but I would recommend to you that you don't start with somebody else's observations about Scripture. You make your own observations about Scripture. It's not wrong to use commentaries or let somebody else help you. But pardon me, the whole, whole thought that, you know, I'm just going to read a, a verse a poem and, you know, three paragraphs by somebody I don't even know every day, and that's going to feed my soul. Uh, let me tell you what that is. That's Twinkie devotions. That's what it is. Why don't you come to the buffet table? And why, don't you, why don't you start feeding on the Word of God yourself? You'll be amazed what God shows you. Then those commentators kind of fill in the blanks. Sometimes you can check yourself, make sure, am I on the right track here? But you're making your own observations. The fourth word. Fifth word, excuse me. Would you write down meditation? So you've got preparation, examination, observation, interrogation, meditation. Now, what is meditation? Meditation is getting into the depth of the passage. Psalm 1, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, Joshua 1, 8 says. But Psalm 1 says we're to meditate in it, what? Day and your whole life. So it's not just when I'm reading it, when I'm looking at it. No, no, I'm putting it in. By the way, that's where Bible memorization comes in. You know why you memorize Scripture? You memorize to meditate. So you take a verse, you commit it to memory so you can chew on it. We'll talk more about meditation in just a moment. So you can chew on it and get all the good out of it, like a cow chewing its cud, all the nutrition out of it that you possibly can. Meditation takes you deeper. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Remember earlier I quoted verse 14? Till I come give attendance to reading, exhortation, doctrine. Come to verse 15. The next verse says we're to meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. I think that's the Bible definition of meditation. If somebody said to me, what does it mean to meditate? You give yourself wholly to a passage. You just, psh, you jump in it. You're in the deep end. You're, you're saturating your soul in it. And here's the problem. In our world, we've lost the meaning of the word meditate. I mean, look. When I even say meditate, most of you see some little guy sitting cross-legged on a rug going, hum. Isn't that right? That's not meditation. It's Eastern meditation. It's manward. This is Godward meditation. It's biblical. That meditation, you know what that meditation's goal is? Empty your mind. Most of us don't have to work too hard at that, do we? You know what Bible meditation is? The exact opposite. Fill your mind. Filling your mind with the Word of God. So how do you meditate? I get asked that question a lot because I use this word a lot. And I have people ask me, say, well, how do you meditate? All right, let me make it very simple. How many of you would like to know how to meditate? There's two Hebrew words, two words used in the Old Testament for meditate. Would you write this down? Because the meaning of the two words gives you the method of meditation. One means to muse. 
You know what it is to muse on something? Think on these things. You got to use your mind. You got to get your mind in gear. And by the way, muse is the opposite of a uh, muse. We're pretty good at the a uh, muse. We're not so good at the muse. We, we've learned to entertain ourselves to the point of mindlessness. So you got to get your mind engaged. But the other word is the word that is most often used in the Old Testament. <laughs> Hold on to your seat. It's really interesting. It means to murmur. Now, when I say murmur, most of you think negative, right? I want to say to you, it depends on what you're murmuring about. This is the only murmuring that God ordains. It's the only positive murmuring. What is it? It's the murmuring of the word. I started quoting a moment ago, Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy what? Mouth, but thou shalt meditate. Did you know in Scripture, God connects meditation not so much just to your mind, but to your mouth? I'm going to tell you something that will help your whole Christian life if you'll pay real close attention right here. Did you know that whatever you talk about, whatever you let yourself converse on, becomes what you concentrate your mind on? People get eaten up with political movements and current trends and local news, and they start talking, talking, talking. And watch this. The more they talk about it, the more consumed they are with it. See, we think, well, whatever you think about, you talk about. That's true. The reverse is also true. This is really profound. Are you ready? Whatever you talk about, you make yourself think about. In fact, did you know that right now I'm meditating? You said, no, you're speaking to us. No, right now I'm meditating. You know what I'm meditating on? Meditation. Because as I'm speaking about it, I'm thinking even more deeply about it. It's not just, I hope, a help to you. It's a help to me. Because just talking about what God teaches in His Word is making me really concentrate and think this through and make it my own again. I believe one of the greatest, write this down please, one of the greatest tools for Bible study is your own mouth. We have several preachers and Bible teachers in this room today. How many of you who have taught or preached the Bible know what I mean when I say that sometimes after you've studied all week long to speak, while you are up speaking, God gives you something from the passage that you had not studied, and it comes out, and you think, where did that come from? Have you ever had that happen? You don't know why that is? Because you didn't just study before you spoke it. You were actually still studying while you're speaking. While you're talking, while you're murmuring it, the Word is opening up to you. Now, that doesn't just work for people who stand on a platform and teach and preach publicly. It works in everyday life. There's some talks you ought to have regularly. One is you ought to talk to yourself. How many of you ever talk to yourself? Just don't answer yourself, all right? I went through the house last night, and I heard, heard my wife, and I said, Baby, who are you talking to? Oh, I was just talking to myself. And uh, I laughed, and she said, I'm not losing my mind. Don't worry about me. But the truth of the matter is we all talk to ourselves. It just matters what you say to yourself. Some of you fuss to yourself every day. It's all negative. You complain, grumble your way through every day. It's why you're perfectly miserable. Some of you criticize all day long. You may not even say it out loud, but you say it to yourself all day long. That's why you become sour. Let me tell you how to get sweet and stay sweet. Talk the word. Talk it. Quote scripture. Talk to God about what the Lord is showing you from Scripture. So talk to yourself. Talk to the author. Who's the author? The Holy Spirit of God. Uh, you, ought to, you ought to commune with the Lord in His Word. We'll talk more about that in another session later today. But you're meeting God in the Bible. This is a living book. This is the only book you're ever going to have that the author goes with you everywhere you go. So you can talk to God anytime. Bluntly, there are many times I come to Scripture and I read something and I don't get it. Do you ever have that happen? I just don't get it. And you know what I do? I talk to God about it. And I just say to the Lord, Lord, you're going to have to help me here. I don't, Lord, I'm reading this, but I don't really understand this. Would you give me light? Would you, would you give me understanding? Talk to yourself. Talk to the author. And then here's where it really gets to application. Talk it to others. Did you know there's probably never a Bible message I ever give publicly, almost without exception, that at some point I've not talked through the basic concept of it with my wife? God bless her heart for what she has to listen to. 
We do it driving down the road. I'll say, you know, I'm studying something right now, and I'll just start talking to her. I'm not preaching at her. She, she gets to preach at me sometimes. You know, I'm not preaching at her. I'm just conversationally just talking to a passage. And if I look at her and she's looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate, I know I'm not ready to preach that yet. It obviously is not clear enough yet. But if I can converse with her, many times she'll say something back to me, and I say, oh, that's good. That, that helped me. That's that many times. See, iron sharpens iron. <clears throat> Spiritual conversation about the Scriptures will open the Word of God to you. And I, I want to recommend this to you, that you learn to use your mouth so that meditation really happens in the Bible. Let's review, class. you got the list in front of you. Say the words. Ready? Number one is what? Preparation. Number two, examination. Number three, observation. Number four, interrogation. Number five, meditation. Number six, I like it, organization. Are you an organized person? <laughs> I heard a resounding nope from somewhere in this room, yes. Some people, they just, you know, they're, they're consumed with organization. Other people, it's just like shoot from the hip, miss spontaneity, whatever it is, you know. But all of us, God is a God who does all things decently and in order. There needs to be some organization to your Bible study or you're not going to retain it. And, and you're not going to have it to give to somebody else. So this is where the use of a journal comes in. And I would recommend that as you go through a passage, you kind of outline the passage. It doesn't have to be a preacher outline. It doesn't have to be kind of outline necessarily that your pastor gives on the Lord's Day. But you outline the passage. You know, these two verses are about this. These three verses go together. They're about this. These seven verses go together. They're about this. And by the way, this is wonderful, but you don't have to bring your outline to the text. The Scripture speaks for itself. The structure and the substance of the text brings the structure and the substance to your Bible study. Just let the Word speak. Sometimes people will say to me, how do you know how many points you're going to have in a sermon? I say, it's up to the passage. There have been passages that I have preached. I just prepared a message that I, I'm going to give in a few days that has one point. Some of you are thinking, boy, I'd like to hear that one. You know, just one, that'd be good. And then sometimes it's seven. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four. Somebody said, well, how do you determine that? I don't. The Word does. I'm just letting the Word speak. You don't bring your skeleton to the Word of God and try to make it live. No, the Word lives. It's a living, breathing book, but you need to outline it so it helps you kind of think through the passage, and it'll help get your mind and heart engaged as you write it down. By the way, a little footnote before, before I go on uh, to the end of this. One way back on the use of the mouth that you can do this every day is sing the scriptures. This week I had a certain Bible phrase on my mind. It's my phrase for the, for the year. Watch and pray. And I've been studying all the watch and pray passages and it's been good for me devotionally. And I found myself the other day just kind of humming and then I started just singing. I don't know, I made up my own little song about watch and pray. I'm not going to sing it for you, so don't wait on that. But I was singing it to myself. Do you know what I was doing? I was just rehearsing it, just getting it in me. And so there may be a scripture song that you come across or write your own and write it down, but it will help you as you study the Bible. Then let's add another word, all right? This is so important, application. Application. This is when you identify a specific personal takeaway. We know what God said. We, we found what God means. Now, what are we going to do with this? Remember, the aim of all Scripture is obedience. You know, I think you would agree with me on this. We all are probably a little disappointed that we're not further along than we are in our Christian faith. Are any of you with me on that? I mean, I feel like I should be so much further along. But let's do this. What if for the next year... You simply, every day, identified one step of obedience from your Bible study. One step a day. Just one. Not many. One. How many class? Just one. Like, this is a good spiritual analogy, like Barney Fife with his one bullet, all right? So, everybody gets one a day. One point of obedience from the Bible every day, and every day we just took that one step of obedience. 
This time next year, if God lets you live and Jesus tears is coming, you'll be 365 steps closer to being what God wants you to be than you are right now. One a day. It's so simple. I think sometimes we make these things so everlasting complicated. But if we give ourselves to the Word and then give ourselves to applying the Word, Spurgeon said the sermon doesn't even begin until the application begins. He meant by that it's not enough to read it and talk about it. We must do something with it. Now, there is one more step, one more ingredient in all of this, but you can't do it. I'm sorry. You can't do it. You're not allowed to do it. It's not your job. Would you write down just one more word? Write down the word illumination. Do you know whose work that is? That's the Holy Spirit's work. The word illuminate means to bring light into something, to shed light on something. If you will do your part and depend on the work of the Holy Spirit, I promise you the Holy Spirit will do His work. Study the Bible in faith. We know faith comes by the Word, but come to it in faith. Believing God's going to show me something. God's going to speak to me. You do your work, and you can guarantee God will do His. Now, the close of this, I want to talk to you about just a handful of practical things, of ways you can study the Bible. Let me just give them to you quickly. First of all, one type of study is what we would call character study. You can study a Bible character. And maybe you have a favorite character. How many of you have a favorite character? That's good. But you may identify some character and study that character. You're looking for lessons, practical lessons that you can bring into your own life. And I'd recommend this too. As you're looking, look for positive and negative. All of us at times may be good examples and all of us bad examples. And God gives us both in His Word. So one of the exciting ways to study the Bible is through character study. The second way is through studying a topic or a theme. In other words, some repeated emphasis found through all the Word of God. Now, how do you do that? I'll give you two suggestions on that. A.T. Pearson, who was a great Bible teacher, used to talk about the law of first mention, full mention, final mention. You ever heard that expression? The law of first mention is the first time something is given in Scripture. The law of final mention is the last time it's given, and the law of full mention is every time it's given. If you're going to study a topic in the Bible, let's say you're going to study grace. Well, you need to find the first time grace is given in Scripture. little hint, it's connected to Noah. You need to find the last time grace is mentioned in Scripture, and then you need to go back and study every time it's mentioned in Scripture because all the parts make the whole. You can't study a topic thoroughly if your Bible study is not thorough. So you need to say, what does God say about the whole of this passage? One other suggestion on topical study, run cross-references. Look at your Bible, the Bible that you have with you. Does it have cross-references in it? Depending on the type of Bible you have, maybe down the middle, a little center column reference, maybe you've never used that. You probably have to get a magnifying glass to see it. But if you can see the little letters, and that's a cross-reference to that phrase or that verse, run those, read those. I bought my son a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. That's a great source for that. But what are you looking for? You're looking for parallel passages, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Remember, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So you're studying a topic. And then you can study a word. Thoughts are conveyed by individual words. There's about 6,000 different words in your English Bible. 6,000 words. Now, behind those words, there are are the words that were given, that God revealed in the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. I'm not recommending that you have to be a Hebrew or Greek scholar to study the Bible. You do not. I took a little Hebrew and Greek in college. It didn't all take on me. But I did learn to use some of the tools. Uh, a good concordance, Strong's Concordance, has a dictionary in the back. You can look up any verse in your Bible, any word in your Bible, Find the little number reference. Go to the dictionary, Old Testament or New Testament in the back and find the root meaning of that word. Now, this week, I pulled out of my library Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. That's a great tool. You want a good source for Bible study? Get you a Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words because it will help you search into the individual word study. And that helps you study the Bible. But I think the greatest way to study, would you write this one down? You've got character and topic and word. Well, the greatest way, and I said this earlier, is by section. Look for a book of the Bible, a section of Scripture, and just concentrate on that. 
a few years ago and enjoying the journey, we did a study of all 66 books of the Bible. It's still available in our archive. We did an episode every day on a book. You say, you can't teach a whole book in a day. We, that's not what we did. I just gave keys to each book. So if you identify a book you want, go back and find the overview of that book and say, okay, here's a starting point. Here's a basic framework for that particular book of the Bible. But take a section of Scripture and make that your own. I love what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said that the way he studied the Bible was this. First, he said, I study the Bible like I gather apples. He said, first, I come to the apple tree and I shake the bottom of the tree. And I see the ripe fruit that falls down. He likened that to studying a book. So get a general impression of the book of the Bible. Glean from it what you can. He said, then, he said, I, I reach up and I grab the limbs and I start shaking the limbs and see what fruit falls off. And he likened that to the study of books of the Bible. He said, then I climb up in the tree and I reach out to the end where the little branches come off the big limbs. And he said, I shake those little branches. And he said, some more fruit, fruit falls off. He said, that's what it is to study a chapter or a verse. He said, then, when I got all the fruit I can from that, he said, I start pulling up leaves and looking underneath leaves because usually there's some fruit hanging on underneath there too. And he likened that to studying words of the Bible. I like that, don't you? If you want your study of the Bible to be fruitful, then you need to give attention to the whole and you need to give attention to the parts. Watch this. If you want your life to be all God wants it to be, you want to have all God has for you, don't wait to heaven. Get in the Word now and study your Bible.